My name is Amanda Quigley and you're here today to do a workshop on the personal narrative. And if we look at the first slide, I suppose every single one of us in this life um, has a story. We all have different narratives from the time we were born to where we are here today. Um, everybody has a story and each one of those stories can help the recovery movement or can help people who are on a recovery journey or who we can educate people about actually what is recovery. And there are three facilitators here today in the true spirit of co-production. There's myself, Amanda Quigley. I'm the peer educator with the Recovery College Southeast. Uh, hi, I'm Oliver Cullen. I've lived the experience, and I'm also a recovery educator in uh, Recovery College Southeast. Uh, Mike Watts, uh, an ex-service user, married to an ex-service user. <laughs> We've all labels up here today. But we're here as uh, three co-facilitators to just give you a little insight into personal narrative training. Um, the personal narrative training and workshop learning and development, whatever you want to call it, has actually come about from research by Mike here. And it is about, uh, I suppose, our stories. And how it came about was, I suppose, ourselves in the Recovery College Southeast. When I started work as a peer educator, I myself have a lived experience um, of a lot of things um, <laughs> from different eras in my life. Um, but I suppose it's, it's quite daunting when you start out utilizing your... Hello, welcome. You can take a seat anywhere, no bother at all. Um, when you're actually using your personal narrative as part of workshops and as part of learning and development, it can actually be quite daunting. Uh, the first time I vocalised, I suppose, my own personal narrative was at another learning set in Kilkenny. And my two legs were like elastic bands and I actually didn't know what I said. So that wasn't really recovery or wellness for me. I was actually quite daunted by the fact of doing it. And then I, I didn't know whether I was coming or going afterwards. So. We had a conversation about it within the recovery college and we decided to put together some uh, formal, I suppose, learning and development around how we can use our own personal narratives. <coughs> so it started off with a co-production team and Mike's research and his expertise. And we sat down and we decided, you know, what do we need? What do we need for people, you know, to learn from this? Um, what did we need? Myself, as a peer educator, what format would I like my recovery narrative to actually take? Um, I didn't want to be verbally vomiting on my students um, or on people I was delivering workshops to because um, verbally vomiting is when you just kind of go blah, 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 and everything comes out of you and there is no, there is no positive energy in it really because you're just vomiting. Simple as that. I know that's not a good word to use in a workshop, but anyway. Um, so there was no therapeutic value in it for myself, for the students, or for the Recovery College Southeast. So we sat down and we looked at a format and a structure and the history behind it as well and where we could actually bring that in. We do educational workshops in recovery and wellness in mental health and addiction challenges. So that was our fidelity. So it started off with an 11-week course. I'm going to move over to this side for recovery, educator, learning and development. And this included three days, intensive days of personal narrative, learning and development. From that, uh, we kind of concised it down to a two-day training program. Um, and uh, this became kind of, it was more structured. Uh, there was more of a format. Like everything, I suppose, in recovery education, you're always changing things and you're always redeveloping and you're always learning. And, and, and then things become different and it becomes more structured. Um, but the fidelity stays the same. Since then, we've trained up a number of recovery educators, Carlo Kilkenny, Waterford and Clamel, and the response has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, we are now uh, looking at a standalone educational workshop in personal narrative as part of our timetable. Um, so much has been the, the benefit of it. And we can see here today there's 35 people who have actually signed up for this as well this morning. So your recovery, your story as a recovery tool. My God, I never thought anybody's story was going to be a recovery tool, let alone mine. But it actually is. It's for yourself and for others to help, I suppose, change um, sometimes what can be a quite a toxic system. Um, 
it's bringing unique experiences uh, to redress the imbalance of knowledge that is within the system. And it's shedding the stigma of psychiatric and addiction labels. Now, what it doesn't say up in that slide is, is that everybody has a personal narrative. Everybody has a story. And that includes from all stakeholder groups. So like myself with the lived or the self-experience, but family members as well, and also those who are working within the service. Because the services are changing at a phenomenal rate, or they're trying to change at a phenomenal rate. And because of that, all of us have a narrative from our different opinions and from where we are. So everybody has a story. In today's workshop, we're going to be looking at, well, the story so far. Um, how do we know anything? So how actually do we know anything? Where does it come from? Evidence-based research, the three dialogues that are included in this personal narrative training. We have a short exercise. We also have incorporated the personal narrative into this workshop, and today um, Adi is going to take the lead on that. And we're also going to look at the recovery map. We also have a framework that you can actually take away with you on how you can actually start to write your own personal narrative. So it's quite good and you can use it from the lived experience family member and also a staff member. Because remember, we're all on a recovery journey. Thanks. Um, Yeah, this is um, the first principle of GROW. I was involved in GROW for 30 years. And it just says, no matter how bad my physical, mental, social, or spiritual condition, I'm always a human person, loved by God if you believe in God, and a connecting link between persons. I'm still valuable. I have a purpose and a unique place in this world that no one else can fill. And then the helper principle, which was coined in 1965 by an American psychologist who studied peer support groups, came to the conclusion it's far more therapeutic to help someone else than to receive help. So when you think about it, we live in a world of made-up stories, and these stories contain knowledge, and they've evolved through our collective human experience of living in the world. And we use this fella, everyone, and he's there throughout time, from the beginning of, of time, everyone is there, and that's you and me. So all the stories ever told constitute a single story. It's our story, one that's ongoing and is being created by us all on a daily basis. What we do, who we are, where we've come from, and where we're going are all individual threads in the tapestry of life. And stories are told in what um, a Russian philosopher philosopher calls a polyphony of personal and social voices. Voices, all of which tell us who we are and whether life is safe or not. So voices are told through our physical sensations in our body, stories, sorry, through our emotions, through our thoughts, through our behavior. But they're also told through our family, our culture, through science, through psychiatry, through business and, and the big pharma. Uh, through politics, and through authoritative experts. So if you ask yourself, how do we know anything? There are three ways to know anything. The first one is scientific inquiry, which is reason, or looking at something from the outside and trying to figure out how it works. And that's really how psychiatry has evolved. It's looking at mentally ill people, trying to figure out how to fix them. Then there's experience. You experience something and you learn from it. But the big problem in, in mental health is authority. Because authoritative stories aren't necessarily true. And the classic one is Copernicus, who was a, a devout Catholic who discovered that the earth wasn't at the center of the universe, which was what the church was teaching from its re through uh, knowledge from reading the Bible. So then we had the Celtic Tiger. In 2008, we had Bertie Ahern saying anyone who didn't believe that the Celtic Tiger was here to stay should go and commit suicide. Um, and yet, authoritative stories have the power to influence how we feel, think, behave, relate, and how we understand and treat mental illness. And stories attract or repel. They act as rallying cries. 
And where there's one, more than one story, one of them tends to dominate the others. So the dominant story in psychiatry, and if you look at the Irish College of Psychiatry's website, it'll say that schizophrenia is a lifelong condition. Um, but a few years ago, we had Dan Fisher over uh, from America. He's a psychiatrist who has recovered from schizophrenia, and he said it may surprise you to learn that I've recovered from schizophrenia. And these days, there are loads of people. My wife has recovered from schizophrenia. I've recovered from schizophrenia. I know loads of people who've recovered from bipolar and schizophrenia. So in 2014, I did an evaluation of um, the first stage of ARI. And I had to ask service users, relatives, and service providers what they understood about uh, recovery to be and a load of other questions. And what came out is that recovery happens between people. It, it's some intangible thing that, that lights a spirit inside a person. And it, remain, it means, among other things, recovering a sense of your own purpose and unique value. And this always necessitates the, value, the input from others. So this was a cartoon that appeared in, in um, an Australian newspaper many years ago. Two, uh, they were actually psychiatrists, um, been, been, uh, graduating, and they said, now I understand, people with brains become professionals, and people with no brains become patients. You meant to laugh at that, Les, but... <laughs> <laughs> my father was a psychiatrist, and my daughter's a psychiatrist, so I find it very funny. But anyway, if you look at it, experience has been almost totally ignored as a valid source, source of knowledge. And it's not just experience of mental illness or distress, it's the experience of being treated. It's the experience of being put on medication with the huge side effects. It's the experience of stigma. Um, it's the experience of public attitudes and the effects of discrimination. And if you think discrimination has gone, the NDA did a survey in 2011 and 65% of people asked said that people with mental illnesses shouldn't be allowed to have sexual relationships. I mean, that's 2011. Um, the four tombstones there are previous um, theories of mental illness. The, f the first one was that mental illness means you've lost your reason. So you treat people like an animal and you terrorize them and beat them back to health. The second one was the um, eugenics that you sterilize people because they're going to infect society. You sterilize them, you segregate them. The next one was lobotomy. You cut it out of them. And the current one is a chemical imbalance, which hopefully is being challenged. So I just want to tell you what narrative research is. It's really people sharing their stories and then analyzing those stories. So it's based on people's experience. It's conducted through interviews. And you just say, can you tell me how? So this group here could do any amount of research on treatment, on mental illness, on recovery. My own research was a narrative study. There were 26 people, 14 women, 12 men. All had been diagnosed with some kind of mental illness, prescribed medication, or hospitalized. They had to have been three years in GROW. They had to be involved in leadership roles, and they had to consider themselves to be recovered. So I just asked each person, how did GROW help you recover? Um, the interviews lasted up to two and a half hours. They were uh, recorded and then professionally described. And then I had to break them down into common themes. And I ended up with half a million words. So the main theme that emerged was that recovery can be experienced as a re-enchantment with life. And I really love that because Max Weber said, the trouble with science when it's applied to human beings is it tends to rob life of enchantment. Recovery as re-enchantment took place in three um, non-linear phases. People became trapped in dialogues of terror. And they came from your physical experiences, your feelings, your thoughts, your own behavior, but also the behavior of others and what had happened to you. And most people in the interviews revealed huge trauma in their lives, sexual abuse, uh, bereavement, uh, dysfunctional families. Um, healing started uh, th through dialogues of healing. And 
when, when people had experienced those for long enough, they started moving out into society. And the stories this morning illustrated that, of being asked to be a secretary on a group. So that you, anyway, I'll keep going. Um, so I, lo I love this, that there are, I interpreted the findings that a human being is a spirit living within a series of storytelling bodies, and they're unique to each of us. So those, those storytelling bodies start with your physical body, your emotions, your thoughts, your behavior, but they're embedded in a family, in a locality, um, a world of experts, a world of business, religion, and politics, and a world where there's wars, there's, there's um, environmental issues, and epidemics, and that's embedded in, in a cosmos, which we know very little about. Okay, oh, that shouldn't be there. Ollie. Cheers. Is it wrong? No, no, it's fine. No, that's right. That's right. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. That's no, that, that, that's fine. Um, overcoming uh, alien identity is very loud, isn't it? My voice is actually kind of loud without a microphone. Uh, think of an unwelcome identity that was given to you by someone in authority or by your peers. For example, thick, ADHD, addict, bully, coward, uh, big in yourself. Uh, or failure, and that's kind of the nice way of putting a lot of these things as well. So, um, now what I'd like to do is, if if it's okay, would anyone like to give an example of something? You don't have to go into great detail or anything like that. We'd encourage not people not to go into detail, um, but could you maybe give an example of something that was said to you or a, a label that was given to you that you felt uncomfortable with, and maybe describe how it made you feel and what helped you overcome that that label. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story, guys. Um, uh, Oliver's my name, or Ollie, as a lot of people would call me. Um, um, I, um, I'm 41. I'm married, very luckily married to my wife is here today to support me, and I have a beautiful daughter. Um, I experienced <clears throat> anxiety and panic attacks. The first time I vividly recall it was around eight years of age. I remember having a, a very terrifying experience and um, over something very small. A very terrifying experience, and it, it actually probably haunted me for about 30 years. I, I've only recently got over it. Um, and it was not too traumatic. It was just my first experience of mental health um, challenges. Um, but I wasn't a very, con as a child, I wasn't very confident. Um, I was quite isolated, and I was, um, I always felt different than everybody else. Until around 14, um, a lot of my peers were taking um, drugs, alcohol, um, which I found was, was it, it was a way of kind of connecting and engaging with people. Um, and you're all kind of on, a, on, a, on the one buzz, if that makes sense, if anyone has ever used in the room. Um, and, and everyone, there's a sense of togetherness, I suppose, with that. But I still I always fe felt like I was on the outside. But anyway, I continued to drink and take drugs. Uh, around 17 or 18, I was pretty much using uh, as much as I could every day. Um, and, uh, it, you know, things started to become very problematic. But I was very much um, a functioning addict, as in I always held down a job, um, and, uh, and I always kind of had, you know, the money to use and, and, and what have you, or else I got from somewhere else. But I used an awful lot on my own, as well as in so, uh, social circumstances. But um, I, I actually managed to get out of that, I suppose break the cycle of drugs um, around 2000. Um, I moved to Cork and uh, from Kilkenny I moved to Cork and I actually broke the cycle of drugs, luckily enough. Um, I was on cocaine for about 12 months before that and I, I pretty much didn't know any dealers in Cork, so I had it in my head to say, I don't know any drug dealers in Cork, that's the way I'll, I'll, I'll make this work. But I drank an awful lot and I, I drank actually probably more than I should. I just replaced the, the drugs with alcohol. Um, but again, I was a, what, I, what we would class as a functioning alcoholic, but we don't use the word alcoholic, but a functioning alcoholic. So I pretty much drank, drank again as much as I could when I could. But, you know, there was a lot of good times in, in that as well, you know, social occasions and, you know, there was a lot of positive stuff um, in relationships and stuff. So it wasn't all bad, but I did know throughout that, I, I actually, in fact, I knew when I started using heavy at, at, the, at the age of 18, I knew there was a, a massive issue, to be honest with you. I, I knew this wasn't going down a good path. Um, so what happened was, anyway, old behaviour started to come up and I, I started feeling, obviously, um, you know, like self-harm and suicide, was de it was definitely an option. 
and I had a couple of breakdowns, uh, I wouldn't talk about them. I would just have them myself. And if anybody, I suppose if anyone even came into the room, I could literally put on a blank face and, you know, uh, as my wife will tell you, you know, she said, how, how are you feeling today? I'm fine. It got to the point where I'm fine was the, the last thing that she wanted to hear. I went to the GP uh, and the GP, because I actually didn't know what was going on. And, a, a, and a, another person, a peer, if you will, um, said to me, uh, I think you need to go to see, see the GP. Um, and I didn't know anything about mental health at the time. Um, and she said, go to the GP and just see what they say. So I did, I, 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 I pleased her by going to the GP and the GP immediately um, diagnosed me with, with the old word for bipolar, which is manic depression. Um, and there was a certain relief in that. Some people don't get relief in it. I got a, a, a quite, a, quite a relief from getting that diagnosis. It was, it was like, this explains why I am the way I am. Um, and it, it actually, I suppose, it, it, it spurned on maybe about a year of being well because I kind of I started to look after myself more. I was aware of it. Um, I had a lot of facts in my head. Uh, I probably didn't edu educate myself about about what was going on, but I kind of I, I changed my lifestyle to a certain extent. Um, but I still used uh, alcohol and I still used drugs. Um, I fast forward to about 2011. I, I ran my own business, and um, I found it very stressful, extremely stressful. And the only way I could cope was um, <laughs> drugs and alcohol again. But it was the same old. It was the same old beast. Um, I had the, the symptoms of uh, bipolar, so ups, downs, anything in between. Um, emotionally, I was very unstable. So um, what I done is I was admitted. To, I was admitted to Pats in 2017, a year ago, and they put me on a dual diagnosis program for uh, addiction and mental health, and it was probably the best thing I ever done. Uh, I was in a very bad place before I went in. I done six weeks of treatment in there, and in that in that space of time. In that six weeks, I decided I was going to get myself better. And I started an education process on myself. I started um, reading up about bipolar, reading up about addiction, and everything in between. Um, I'll come to it later on, so I won't go on about it, but when I came out, I got involved in recovery. And that has probably been, I, I'm sober a year now, my mental health is far, far better than it was. And for the last year, I've been heavily involved in recovery co-production, the recovery college, setting up peer networks. I'm involved in smart recovery. I've become a facilitator, and all these things have helped my journey. But this, I suppose, I'll finish with this, but the start of my recovery journey came after I got out of treatment and I actually started engaging with underground services. Actually, I have one more quote, if you don't mind, and it's by Jim Morrison. I'm a big fan of Doris, Jim Morrison. And he said, you feel your strength in the experience of pain. And that's how I feel. Thanks. Okay, okay. so um, what emerged from my research was that there were two processes, and they were the same process. The process of becoming mentally ill or distressed, and the process of recovery. And <clears throat> it started with um, a somatic experience. And I've, I've heard people talk about traumatic counseling, and they talk about the primitive brain. And our body reacts, it has these mechanisms that try and protect us. So um, people described uh, all these things that triggered um, a physical feeling. And the way they described that physical feeling was, I remember the wild sense of upset and loss. I was rattled altogether. My whole system was knocked haywire. It was soul destroying. I had no safety. And those feelings came in response to illness, homelessness, poverty, bereavement, uh, betrayal, failure, suicide, unemployment, addiction, isolation, or loneliness. Or they could be, like Ollie said, um, something very small that triggers um, this, this feeling. And, and the thing about it was there, there was nobody there to kind of say, well, that's okay, or let's talk it through, or uh, you can recover from it. So that kind of um, somatic conversation then began to attract toxic emotions. So people said it made me feel dreadful, dreadful. It was like driving a car with no brakes and no steering wheel. I should have had rage printed on my forehead. I was terrified, it was disgusting. And in the uh, eighth 
step of the GROW program. It says that we start to think by reason rather than by feelings and imagination. And in mental illness, I really believe that your thinking becomes um, too much influenced just by your feelings and your imaginings. So the toxic feelings gave rise to a whole load of toxic thoughts. I was sure there was a plot happening. And then my mind started to go really weird. So I thought, if I just kill myself, everything will be all right. There was no hope for anything. And uh, anybody who knows CBT, there's this negative cognitive triad. I'm no good. Everybody knows I'm no good. Therefore, there's no point in trying anymore. And the thoughts and the emotions began to steer people towards isolation and alienation. So the person who said, my, think my thinking started to go really weird, began taking razor blades and cutting himself up. Another person who had rage printed across his forehead said, I wanted to kill the bastard. It was a, a night watchman who'd abused him when he was eight. Another fella who was really key to the whole research said, I thought I'd lost my soul and the only way to get it back was to drown myself. And he was adamant he wasn't trying to commit suicide. He said he lived in this world like a, a myth mythological world. And he had to do this. He had to drown himself to find his soul. And another person said, my w world just got smaller and smaller, and she retreated to her bedroom. And it's usually at this point that people are diagnosed as mentally ill or addicted. And the chaos in the body is usually treated with powerful drugs. And there's nothing wrong with that. They can be lifesavers. They should be the starting point for recovery, though. And that's where an awful lot of people get stuck because I know people who've been on um, antipsychotic drugs for 30 years, and it still seems to be the same. There's no expectation that, okay, this is what you need now, and we'll help you, but this is what you have to do to begin the recovery process. Okay, so some of the dialogues of terror. This was a, a friendly neighbor um, who abused, sexually abused this girl when she was about eight. It went on for two years. It made me dreadful. People talked about bullying, bereavement, unemployment, accidents, failure. Um, this is another chap. He, they lived in Birmingham. They were from the west of Ireland. And his mother had eight children and, and a couple of miscarriages. And he was eight. And she would leave him in control of the family and say, when I get back, I want everything to be perfect. And it never was. So he was hammered by um, his mother. He was 33rd at school out of 33 because he was dyslexic. And he was hammered by the teacher. And then the priest came in for first confession and said, if you confess and promise never to do these things again, everything will be perfect. So at the age of eight, he knew he was condemned for the rest of his life. And that fellow now, he's a, he's a project lead in environmental management. And he has a first class honors degree in biology. And the thing that came across was that quite often, not always, and there were stories where professionals had really been key in the dialogues of healing, but this was the chap who, who cut himself with razor blades. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was heavily medicated and sent home. And he sat at home and he said, I can't live like this. So he went back to the doctor and said, when is the medication going to start to work? And he sort of looked very gloomily at me, and he says, well, you'll be on medication for life. I don't think you'll ever hold down full-time work. Friendships may be difficult. You'll never drive, never have a house of your own, never have relationships. I was now 19, and that chap now is married. He has his own business, and he works with deaf and, deaf and, deaf and blind people in, in the north of Ireland. Okay. Um, a lot of other people said that the system isn't interested in you. They don't want your story. They're only interested with your symptoms. One fellow at his first um, meeting with a psychiatrist said he wasn't even looking at my face, just writing. And another chap said, the longest conversation I had with any professional was 10 minutes in 20 years. Extraordinary, isn't it? So the chap who was taken out of the river said, recovery began for me when I left my small self and joined a bigger self. And that kind of gave the idea that peer support and healing relationships is a nurturing social womb. It, it's a social body that nurtures you with all the things you need to recover. So the same process started. 
people talked about this feeling of tranquility that they, they experienced when they joined a GROW meeting. And they didn't join it lightly. It, it, it took a lot of courage to go. And I heard the same comment from people in Olus, that the biggest thing was to meet other people who had experienced the same thing. So people said there was a feeling of warmth, how friendly they were. I connected, and I'd lost that connection. It was amazing to meet people who understood. And that fear I had sort of left me. So then people began to experience positive emotions like hope. I felt I got hope and hope had never occurred. She'd been in hospital seven times. I felt I'm going to get better in this place. Something resonated. It did some kind of transformation, physical, emotional, everything. So that began to affect the way that people thought. So examples where I said to myself, Jesus, I should be able to do that. The first step, thinking I can get well and stay well, I started to think more positively about myself, and I realized many others had come through traumas. So that began to influence people's behavior, so that instead of isolating at home, I felt I'll go next week, and I wasn't even capable of thinking that far ahead. And in the group, I would start to talk about my story. And uh, very small steps, I would try and say something and begin to cry, but then the, the social womb would put a, a healing arm around me. So this, this is just a diagram of, of the eight dialogues, dialogues of healing. And you don't have to be qualified. It's pouring your goodness, your, your, your wishes, your compassion onto the other. And we take it in turns in the peer support to be the fellow in the center. So receiving a warm welcome, experience empathic, empathic and compassionate witness, becoming hopeful and believing in possibilities, reconnecting with self and others, taking positive risks, the dignity of failure. We all have to be allowed to fail. I mean, pain, that quote from, from the, 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 that Ollie gave, reauthorizing positive identities, transforming understandings, and engaging with the spiritual dimension of self. So people talked about dialogues of, cover, uh, of becoming, finding employment, voluntary or, or paid. Education, two thirds of people in my sample had done a course in theology or philosophy just to find out what the feck is life all about. It's as basic as that. Um, another person, leisure, one person joined the jo golf club and he found when he was playing badly, he started getting angry and then he'd get paranoid. But then he realized that everyone else was getting angry when they paid played badly, and they started acting paranoid. Um, becoming part of... Am, am I finished now? It's up to you. Pardon? <laughs> Come on, sorry. <laughs> it's fine. It's only one slide now, anyway. Sorry. No, that's fine. No, that's fine. It's, my, it's Mike's thing, anyway, so... Um, becoming part of the social good and the possibility of providence. I wanted to give something back. That's how I felt. Even after getting into recovery after a few months, I actually realized that you do actually want to give back something. And 80% and of people that are in recovery do actually give back to their communities, whether it's voluntary, whether it's getting involved in, in gardening or, or schemes or whatever, they give back. Um, mm -hmm. I set up a phone service for suicidal young people. Uh, I became involved in the local parish youth centre. Things that happened in my life that cannot be explained by reason and providence has featured greatly in my life. I, I know from myself that things were said to me in school by people that I respected and they felt I had some worth. And they actually mentioned to me very much in my mid-teens that I was belong, you know, I, I belonged to something that you know, was listening to people or, or helping people or talking with people. And life, and life goes a completely different direction. But now it's actually come back around full circle and I'm involved now in peer support and recovery education. So I believe that, that Providence has featured greatly in my life. So pass the mic over. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know if you know Patricia Deegan. She was diagnosed with schizophrenia at 18 and she's got a, a really beautiful um, uh, uh, article called Recovery is a Journey of the Heart. And she says in, when you become mentally ill, your heart turns to stone and you lock people out. And she said that the journey is that you begin to realize that a heart can leap with joy and that the heart isn't only a physical pump, it's some existential thing that lives in the, in the heart of us. So when you're making a recovery map, 
you have to realize we're all surrounded by resources, and resources are other people. So you start with your friends, family, and your neighbors, and you begin to say, is there anyone in my family who will go for a walk with me, teach me how to cook, show me how to play cards? Five minutes, okay? Show me how to play cards. One, one fella, I was like a block of wood in my life. I could not put my hands up to, to cheer or anything like that. I was terrified. And um, we had a neighbor who used to thump the table playing cards, and he'd say, up sticks, wallop carty. And he became a role model for me, and he never knew it. And another shy fella used to sing a song, and I'd look, I, I, I'm a, a closet singer. So anyway, ask yourself how any of these could... Um, so then, in every place in Ireland now, there's a huge number of ongoing peer support groups. AA, NA, GA, Grow, Aware, Smart Recovery, Hearing Voices Network, Shine, Recovery, BodyWise. And those peer support groups allow you into a social, um, a social womb that's healing. And these are the nutrients of recovery, things like leadership, hope. Um, so what we've done is designed a recovery map. And the different colored dots are different resources. So you have peer support, and then you have the green dots are things that you can use when you want to, like involvement centers, the recovery college, the rape crisis center, men's sheds, women's refuge. And then the pink dots are the professionals. And usually, you see a psychiatrist, you don't really know what he's meant to be doing. He hasn't got time to get to know you. But if you uh, form a relationship with your psychiatrist, they can then refer you to counseling, to family therapy, to a social worker, to deal with the issues that you have. And then the blue dots are things like employment agencies, uh, educational programs, national learning network, um, <clears throat> uh, music, uh, dance, art, uh, mindfulness, all these things that you can learn. So I think that's it. No, so this is your slide, is it? Remember? Yeah. It's not the format that we usually work in. Guys. No, it's We're not. Okay, so I suppose that's an overview of the personal narrative training and um, where it actually came from. It's not how we actually deliver the training. It was just a snapshot of it. Um, there's a lot more exercises. There's a lot more reflective practice in it for actually our students to do. Um, it's like a little bit of homework, but we don't call it homework. We call it reflective practice. Um, what it is, it's actually teaching people how to put their own narrative together, number one, and teaching them how to use it as a tool of recovery rather than something that stops them and stifles potential. So I suppose uh, how you can use the voice of experience in your area to change the system. Um, and Lucy Johnson in Dublin in 2018 said, it's not a chemical imbalance really, going back to what Mike said in the, in the theory that's now with us. Uh, it's a power imbalance, really. And it's not them and us. It's everybody together. So we have some handouts. Um, what we do is, in our training, as I said, there's a lot of reflective practice in it to teach people how to put their dialogue of terror together, their dialogue of healing, and then their dialogue of becoming. And the dialogue of terror becomes a small section of it. The dialogue of healing becomes a big midsection, and then the dialogue of becoming becomes the largest section of it. Whether you're becoming a peer educator, a recovery educator, someone who's living well with anxiety, like myself, or who's living well with whatever clinical diagnosis you've got, or living well as a family member, or living well as a member of staff who's trying to change the service. So uh, we have two, uh, three handouts. One is a copy of the slides, and two are literally a little framework for putting together the personal narrative and where to actually start. So you'll see that there's actually two separate ones. There's one for professionals, and this is Mike's work. He's actually put this together from his own research. 
Um, there's one for the personal narrative, for the person with the lived experience or the self-experience. And then we've also actually added another piece as well for those who are working within the service, because sometimes it can be quite difficult for a person to disclose their own personal narrative whilst they're working in a professional capacity. Um, so again, we're quite conscious of that, and, and we, but we want it all to be all of us together. Um, so that's it. That's the personal narrative. That's a brief workshop. We had to fit it into 40 minutes. Um, so I'd like to thank you for being here today. Um, and my co-facilitators, Oliver Cullen and Mike Watts. <laughs>